to the Spot Actor Podcast. I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. On today's podcast, we're talking about how to choose the best natural sunscreen for your skin, your health, and the environment. My guest is Katie Kimball, who has been a blogger since 2009 at Kitchen Stewardship, and she's been helping families stay healthy. And as part of her natural living quest, she and her four kids and her sensitive skin husband have personally tested over 100 different sunscreens. So she's built a reputation for being an excellent source of information on sunscreen reviews in the natural living world. When they're not A-B testing sunscreens, her kids are learning to cook and inspire their generation with the Kids Cook Real Food eCourse. In today's podcast interview, Katie shares what she looked for when testing over 100 sunscreens with her family and what she learned along the way. And we cover the best and worst ingredients for sun protection, your health and the environment. And we even share our top favorite sunscreen brands. So please enjoy this interview. Katie, it's great to have you on the Spot Doctor podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here. I geek out on sunscreen, so it's fun to get to talk about it. Yes, you definitely have been geeking out on sunscreen. You've been spending a lot of time on this, so I wanted to have you on the podcast because this is something we get asked all the time. Are safe sunscreens, what chemical ingredients to avoid or what to avoid entirely, what to include. So let's dive into this. But first, why did you become so passionate about this? You know, so I started blogging in 2009 and I'd always been sort of like an environmentally conscious kid. One of my favorite books as an elementary student was 50 Things Kids Can Do to Save the Earth. And that was before it was actually like a popular thing to do. Um, but I, I mean, I, you know, I always have so much to learn. So as a young mom with one toddler, I was slathering chemical sunscreen on him every day with his clothes and his diaper. Like that was part of our routine. And in 2010, as they started learning about the dangers of those ingredients, I was just devastated, right, with my former choices. Obviously, we can only do what we know at the time. Um, but in, in 2010, I looked at EWG, the Environmental Working Group, and they only had 40 sunscreens at the time that were rated one or two, that were rated really safe. And I had this thought, like, what if I could get my hands on all of them? Like, what if I could try them all? Because it's great to have ratings, but they're just like academic ratings based on the ingredient safety. Nobody actually knows like if they go on like white out or paint drying, you know, or lotion. And I thought, what if there was like someone in the field like who's actually trying it on real family? So that first summer I got 28 of the 40 and it's just sort of snowballed since then every summer adding you know, between like four and 20 brands. And now my poor family, we're at 120-ish mineral sunscreen brands that we've tried. And so, I mean, my kids just, they don't even know how to put on sunscreen if it's not side A, B testing with two different brands on to see what happens. Yes. And so I, you know, and I have done, I've ordered a lot of different sublex and I've had every year I could like clear them out, throw them out because, you know, whatever the ones are that have expired or that um, have, are just too pasty or somehow some sort of toxic ingredients kind of snuck into our, our cabinet from you know, one of my teen kids putting something in there. <laughs> um, but it really is not just what's in the ingredients because that's a big part of it, but how does it truly protect your skin? And of course, all of these, if it has an SPF on it, it has to go through certain testing with the FDA approval and all of that. But also, how does it feel? What's the experience like, especially when you're putting them on your face? Like I got one recently, it was a tinted version and it was really natural. I love the ingredients. I put it on, it was super pasty. And then the next day, I immediately had like little white heads popping up. It completely clogged my pores. And so that one's done. And so it's, it's, you know, it's really great that you've tested all these different ones. So what, what exactly are you looking for when you're testing these? Yep. We, we always write down, you know, who's wearing what so that we remember. And I ask my kids right away, like, what do you think? How does it smell? How does it, how does it feel going on? And man, there are some, Trevor, where you put them on and like there is, it's impossible to rub it in. I call it like white out drying, like it's drying too quickly almost even to rub it in. And so those, you know, get demerit points immediately. Um, we look for even, even something as simple as overwintering. Can it last a winter 
in the cupboard without completely separating or solidifying when it, in the case of sticks. Um, you know, yeah, so consistency, we look for waterproofness. I'll try to say, okay, kids, like jump into the pool and then like show me your arms and is it kind of, sometimes you can see it just beating up. You're like a duck. I'm like, all right, that I assume will stay on in water really well. And, um, and then we look at the side AB testing is because we're looking for burns. If anybody does burn, if they burn on one side and not the other, I have a data point, you know, that, that that side, that A side is not doing as well and, you know, kind of knock it down on the list. So out of that 120, I only have usually in any given year between like six to 12 that are in my highly recommended status because I'm so picky right? If there's, if there's brands with like absolutely perfectly clean ingredients, why would I go with anything other than that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and just to be clear, everyone, these are not peer reviewed, double blind, placebo controlled studies, right? We're talking about Katie just doing this with her kids. This is not, I mean, this, there is definitely science behind this, but it's not, you know, a, a typical study. Exactly. So, not lab testing, <laughs> field <laughs> testing. So it's the mom on the ground saying, don't buy this one, even though it might work to protect from burns because it's, you know, it doesn't go on well or it gets in the kid's eyes or whatever. All right. And, and, but I, but I love this and I think it is important because there's practicality to this and, um, and it is can, confusing though. Do you, can you explain to people about the SPF process, like how these things are approved? I'm sure you've learned a lot about this along the way. I have. Yep. Yeah. I've interviewed a lot of sunscreen formulators. I've gotten on the phone with like old school guys who were like, yeah, I was around in the eighties when the highest SPF was four and just like soaking up all this knowledge over the last 10 years. Um, so SPF is an important number, but very, very confusing um, because SPF 30 protects from about 96 point something percent. SPF 50 is only about 97%. And so, although you think you're getting considerably more protection, you know, and we think numerically 30 to 50 should be a grand difference. Oh, and then 50 to 70 or 75 or 80, which they sell, you, you feel like you're so much more protected when you're getting like a half percent more protection. And that's why those SPF numbers can be really dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, the FDA has considered capping it at 50. They haven't taken the leap yet. They tend to take about 20 years to make a decision. So I'm not holding my breath. But those, those SPF 80 and 100, they, they are dangerous because they make people feel like they're wearing a black tarp, which means they stay in the sun longer and they reapply less often. And so they're probably getting way too much sun exposure, especially as those sunscreens degrade because they're, they're chemical sunscreens. Zinc, you're never going to get a zinc sunscreen at an 80 or 100 SPF because you would look like Casper the Friendly Ghost, 100% certainty. Um, the other really tricky thing about SPF is that it's only rating the UVB protection, right? Mm -hmm. So we have UV, UVA, UVB, and UVC rays. UVA, this is one I'm sure your audience talks a lot about because that's the aging damage, skin, you know, sun damage, as well as some cancers. UVB is what you see in the burns immediately, as well as some cancers. And until 2014, honestly, the SPF numbers only looked at UVB. Like brands were only um, required to test high for UVB. So at that time, anything before 2014, most likely your sunscreen was not protecting you at all from UVA because it's different. And when, and when we're talking petrochemical sunscreen ingredients, it's actually different ingredients that are gonna protect from the different rays of the sun. That's one reason I love zinc oxide because it is the only FDA approved sunscreen ingredient, chemical or mineral, that protects from both UVA, UVB, broad spectrum in a well-balanced way. All right. If we've got sunscreen formulators using petrochemical sunscreen ingredients, they have to figure out their own balance. They have to figure out the balance of how protectant that sunscreen is going to be from UVB, which again is signified by the SPF, tested by the FDA, like it's very official. And then they have to figure out how well they're going to balance that UVA protection. That's much less regulated. So if you've got an SPF 80 or 100, which I think are criminal, there's a good chance your UVA protection is not as strong as your UVB. So you're not going to see the problem the next day. You're not going to think you bought a bum sunscreen because you don't see that immediate burn, but that long-term skin damage is, is most likely happening at alarming rates. Yeah. 
Yeah, that and that is a really important one too because it's that it's that little bit of damage every day. You know, you're driving your car, you have your hands on the steering wheel, the tops of your hands are getting all all of that. Even if you're not getting a burn, you're getting all that sun damage on your hands, your face so through the window, all of that. It, and I think a lot of times people don't think about that. Their skin's not changing immediately or you know within a day or you know that that yeah. color doesn't show up then they think that it, that nothing is happening. Um, so this is so important. And I think a lot more sunscreens are saying UVA and UVB protection. They'll actually say that on the label if they have that added protection, right? Yes, that's true. And since 2014, that's been required. It's it's just that the, the balance, the amount mm -hmm. or pro powerfulness of the UVA protection isn't as regulated as the UVB because there's not a number. Right. You know, UVB is the SPF. Okay. So when we talk about safe sunscreens, there's two different areas that we're talking about. There is the environmental impact, and then there's also the human health impact. I've, as a naturopathic physician, I focus a lot on the human health impact on it because that's, you know, my priority. But of course, we want to do things. Usually when you protect human health, you're also protecting the environment but not necessarily. So let's start with the, the environmental impact. And there's been a lot of attention on reef safe and that mm -hmm. being, so can you explain to everybody, what are the concerns about the environmental impact of sunscreens and you know what you've learned about that? Yeah, luckily in this case, the human safety and the reef safety is a very synonymous. So when we say one, we say the other, that's a good thing. Um, just a few years ago, Hereticus Labs, um, powered by Dr. Craig Downs, did some research that proved that two sunscreen ingredients, oxybenzone and octenoxate, were causing coral reef bleaching. And bleaching is like, it's like near death. <laughs> it's, it's nearly dead for a coral reef. Now we've lost 50% of the Great Barrier Reef in just the last 10 years. It's predicted that if we don't change what we're doing as humans to impact the oceans, that we will lose 90% of the coral reefs by 2050. That is not good. I mean, obviously, they coral reefs are where most marine life is housed, and so it would be it would be a massive devastation to the ecosystem. Um, and thousands and thousands of tons of sunscreen wash off human bodies into the ocean every year. And that doesn't just include if you live near an ocean. That includes like 37 states in the Midwest all run off to the Gulf of Mexico. So you know, even if you're deep in the middle of you know the land it's still definitely a problem even you know for the reefs um and then what else is i'm trying to think also um triclosan is in a lot of sunscreens and parabens are in a lot of sunscreens and those are pegged for some problems with marine life as well um, oxybenzone and octinoxate are the two chemical sunscreen ingredients that are banned in hawaii which is very exciting that there's legislation that goes into effect in 2021 so you won't be able to bring chemical sunscreens into Hawaii, you won't be able to buy them there. Um, but uh, it's, I get so frustrated about this because this law has opened up a whole new sphere of greenwashing mm -hmm. where the big brands are taking out only those two ingredients, mm -hmm. figuring out how to rebalance their formulas with all chemical ingredients still and marketing them as reef friendly is the term you'll see on the front of the tube. So people going to Hawaii are like, oh great, reef friendly, like I'm doing the right thing. And then in Hawaii, you know, snorkel captains and people who are close to the reefs will grab their bottle and go, sorry, you can't bring this on my boat. Like, I know it's, 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 in the, it's within the law, but it's still not good enough because they know that those other chemical sunscreens most likely are doing the same thing, the same problem. It just hasn't been proven yet. Um, so that is a bummer because you used to be able to see reef safe and think, great, I found a safe sunscreen. Now there are tons that are saying reef friendly and they're completely chemically based. So you, you mentioned two chemical sunscreen ingredients, but there are others. And mm -hmm. so like avobenzone, um, is that one not safe for reefs as well? Or are there, are there ones that are chemical sunscreen ingredients that we, we think that might be okay? Right. Avobenzone, again, hasn't been proven yet. The research isn't there yet. Um, avobenzone is the one chemical sunscreen ingredient that's protecting from UVA. So that's been interesting with me watching things over the last 10 years. Before 2014, I never saw avobenzone. I didn't know what it was. 2014, the FDA said, hey, whoa, oh my goodness, you all better start protecting us from UVA as well. So now everybody has avobenzone. And guess what problem that causes? It might not be killing the coral reefs. It might be, we don't know yet, but it actually stains your laundry and the stains don't show up until they're washed with soap. And it looks like rust stains. Isn't that a bummer? So, I mean, at least for your laundry habits, skip the avobenzone. 
Okay. Well, and it has to be used in combination because it's, it yep. doesn't provide the UVB protection. So then you have to use other chemical sunscreens. Yep. But, but so, so you're saying we really need to stay away from the chemical sunscreens, at least for environmental reasons, and yes. then focus on more of the mineral sunblocks. Um, and so when we talk about mineral sunblocks, we're mostly talking about zinc oxide, but there are other minerals ingredients that are used in some mineral sunblock. So can you talk more about that? Sure thing. When we talk about the, the mineral-based sunscreens, there are two um, ingredients, the zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Both are FDA approved. Um, both are broad spectrum. Titanium dioxide is just more unbalanced. It provides more UVB than UVA. So when I see a sunscreen that only has titanium dioxide, I'm like, oh, that might not be as balanced as you want it to be. So typically you'll see them in tandem or you'll see only zinc oxide. Um, I tend towards zinc oxide for a couple of reasons. One, it's FDA approved even for kids under six months. This is what's in, you know, your traditional baby cream, diaper cream. Um, so it's just incredibly, incredibly safe. Titanium dioxide being a heavy mineral, or I'm sorry, a heavy metal, has some potential risks because of that. And so since zinc oxide is already broad spectrum protective, I just stick with zinc, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw away something of mine if it had titanium dioxide. Because sometimes the um, titanium, the inclusion of titanium can cause it to be a much nicer feel, a much more clear look. So if you're going especially for ladies' faces, that's a, an easy, small concession to make. Okay, so and when it comes to an environmental impact, they're both going to be the same, or are there is there any concern about titanium dioxide for environmental impact? Environmental Im impact is far from no, both are not be safe. They're both uh, uh, they're both safe. You said mm -hmm. yep, great. Um, okay, so let's let's talk more about we were talking a lot about the environmental impact and reef safe. I'm glad you cleared that up. Let's talk more about the health impact um, because we are putting these on our body. They don't just sit on the outside of our skin. They do some of this, the, these ingredients can get absorbed and that's both the chemical ingredients as well as mineral. And, um, and then if something's in a spray or a powder, we can breathe it in, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a lot to cover. <laughs> Let's start with the absorption on the mm -hmm. skin, the, the, the topicals that we apply. What have you learned about these? Absolutely. So the great thing about zinc oxide is that being a mineral, as long as you aren't finding a brand with um, nanoparticles of zinc, which are under 100, under 100 nanometers, those may be absorbed. But anything other than nanoparticles is actually not absorbed. It sits on the surface of the skin. Um, and it causes more of a reflective and scattering effect with the sun. Doesn't really give off any byproducts, just a little bit of heat. All the chemical sunscreens, on the other hand, by their nature, chemical, like they, they work because of a chemical reaction with the sun itself. Mm -hmm. And high school chemistry, chemical reactions have byproducts. And those byproducts cause oxidative stress on and beneath the skin, which of course, like we're putting on sunscreen to prevent skin cancer, mostly, most people and other things too. So to put on, you know, a compound that could be potentially causing cancer because of oxidative stress, just seems foolish. Um, the other reason, once we dig into the science of chemical sunscreens, is that because there's a chemical reaction going on, that means they're being used up. They're degrading. And so after about two hours in the sun, your chemical sunscreen isn't working anymore to protect you. It's degraded so much. And that's where we get that rule of you must reapply every two hours. All your zinc oxide tubes will say that as well, because the FDA just hasn't differentiated its um, recommendations. It's not nearly as necessary with zinc because it's, I mean, it's like a rock. It doesn't go anywhere. So I tell people it's kind of like buying landscape rocks, which are more expensive at first, but they're not going to go anywhere versus mulch. You know, every one to two years, you got to re-spread that mulch, purchase it again and re-spread it because it's degraded into soil. Chemical sunscreen is very similar. It's degrading. So after two hours, not only are you not protected, but the, the chemical, chemicals are deeper and deeper in your skin creating those free radicals, causing oxidative stress. So it's imperative to reapply to protect your skin from that chemical reaction continuing to happen. It's, well, it's ridiculous. Just don't use chemical sunscreen because, you know, first of all, it's, it might not even be protecting you from the sun. It might not be protecting you from skin cancer. It might cause skin cancer. And most of those chemicals have been proven to be endocrine disruptors. 
So as a mom, like with kids, I want grandkids. My kids, you know, poor little bodies are being bombarded with enough toxins that are estrogen mimicking and endocrine disrupting in this world. I'm not going to voluntarily put it on their skin. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Well, and, and I, I have used a lot of different sunblocks myself and I'm really like the zinc oxide ones. Um, and so you do feel that they're, they're safe. Um, I have had people ask me, what about some of that? If they're, they're the zinc absorption, are we worried about high zinc levels? But it sounds like you're saying that the absorption is just not there. So we're right. not going to be really getting um, excess zinc, especially this form of zinc that we use in a topical isn't necessarily the kind that we would take as a supplement. It's a different yes. form of zinc. So, um, but we have, have you seen any tests looking at um, any kind of uh, laboratory testing that's been done post using zinc oxide sunblocks and to see if there are any levels elevated? Yep. Yeah, I have read some studies. Um, and again, it comes down to as long as it's not nanoparticles. Nanoparticles do show some tendency to have some absorption. And again, titanium dioxide has a little more potential to be absorbed um, than zinc oxide in some some head-to-head -head research studies. So again, that's why I tend towards zinc and looking for non-nanoparticles is a really good habit um, when you're reading those tubes. The uh, chemicals, on the other hand, they're pretty immediately absorbed within hours. They show up in the bloodstream. Oxybenzone is in 97% of Americans' urine. So it's pervasive, it sticks around, it's in infant cord blood. Um, and in fact, I was just reading a study this week that it was, it was looking at three different sunscreen chemicals. Not, again, not zinc and titanium, but the other guys. And the, the amount of blood percentage was much higher than the FDA um, deems as acceptable or deems as safe. And in fact, the FDA is considering, they'll take 20 years to make the decision, but they're considering removing the generally recognized as safe and effective, the grass status from all sunscreen ingredients except zinc and titanium. Oh, wow. Yeah, because more and more of these studies are starting to come out and they're going, oh, wow, I mean, we jumped the gun on those. Kind of typical. Yeah, and, and what I've read about titanium dioxide, I really think it is better to stick with more of the zinc oxide. I do have concerns about that. Um, I, I know, that, and you mentioned the, the nano zinc that we want to stay away from that, and it should say on the label, right, that it's non-nano sized or it'll say nano size. I mean, how, what do you look for on the label? Um, most of the time. And this is, oh. you know, we, we just kind of have to trust the brands. I think, I think most brands who are really, really trying to do the right thing, they know what the right thing is. And so they're going to, you know, they're going to brag about being non-nano because they know that people are looking for that. So definitely best to look for non-nano. If it's not on the tube, this is where I'd start digging into their website and dig as deep as I can get. Um, cause somewhere it's always somewhere and there's micronized too, which is, sort of in between. Micronized is smaller than a normal size particle, but larger than nanoparticles. They're thought to be safe. Um, and again, especially for ladies' faces and sort of something that goes on nice and clear, a lot of people will tend toward micronized in those cases. Okay. And those are safe. Yeah. So that was going to be one of my next questions is to talk about you know, the zinc oxide sunblocks, they have changed so much. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that the only way you could wear them is like this white or maybe even hot pink right? <laughs> across your nose and your cheeks. But there's, there are some that are way better than this now. Why is that? Now, I think a lot of people, that's one of the reasons why they were reaching for the nano size, maybe because they thought that the texture would go on better. So what do we look for now as far as the user experience of having that same kind of protection with being able to put it on our face or, and, you know, putting it over our entire children. Yep. How do we do that? Well, and that's where I come in, right? Because I've, I've touched them and worked with them and, and I never write up a review after just like one time, like, okay, I'll just put it on quickly and I'll write up a review. Like we use these things for a whole summer before I'll even enter them into, you know, the system. Um, I think brands are getting, they're just getting better at, good emulsifications are getting better at getting those particles of zinc suspended consistently throughout the tube and so that all helps and then again getting smaller particles but not so small that it's going through the skin is sort of the sweet spot for making them better and there's just so much more competition which is a great thing 
right? I mentioned in 2010, EWG only had 40 that they recommended as safe. Now there, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Like I can't, there's no way I can keep up with all of them, which is wonderful. And that, that spirit of competition is going to raise the bar. Yeah, that's so great. Um, okay, and, and I wanna talk brands in a moment, um, but let's go through some of these other, other things. You're, you're, you're okay with talking about brands that you like, right? Oh yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. Um, because I'm excited to do that. But before we go into that, a few other things. Tinted versions. Um, I'm a big fan of some of these. I wanted to see your take on it. Yeah, and in fact, I just kind of missed the opportunity to say that. Is that another reason that they can go on so nicely is because of those nice light tints. It just it just really covers up sort of the whitish cast <laughs> that you can get sometimes. I remember my husband putting on one in particular. It was a big stick and it went on really nicely. And he walked out of the bathroom. I said, "Honey, you look like one of those busts." of like an old philosopher sitting in on a library shelf. Like that is not a good look. Um, so the tinted can really help tone that down. And yeah, I mean, there are so many brands that are doing a great job with tints and still using very clean ingredients. Um, they, they don't always look right on kids. Like they can look pretty good, even on fairly pale skin, but they look kind of funny on kids. So with kids, we just, eh, we put on whatever. We're, they can't be too aesthetically perfect. <laughs> but for adults, those tints can be really nice for the face. Right, it does. And it is nice. To, um, and um, do the tints add an extra layer of protection or can they? Sometimes it depends what ingredient. So um, I've got brands that use cocoa powder to tint. Some brands use titanium dioxide as some of the tint so that it might, it might cause better, you know, more protection. Um, but really, I mean, all of these brands are SPF rated. So it's not like you're going to get a, a big surprise. Like, oh, wow, I bought an SPF 15 and it's acting like a, you know, 50. They're, you know, they're rated for what they're rated for. Right. And I do want to mention about the tents that there are some companies that are better than others as far as having a variety of tents. Some of them will have like one tent. Yes. It's not going to work for all skin tones and types. So you, you got to find the right company that's going to help match if you're going to use a tinted version. And, and really with darker skin types, you're going to want to go with a tinted version, right? Because the, the, the natural whiteness of the zinc oxide is going to, it's going to show up more on darker skin. So with pigmentation, you, you want to find the companies that have a wide range and then for people that are super fair, uh, you, you know, again, if you use something that's too dark, it's going to make you look funny. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it, there, there is some um, variability with that. That's, that is a challenge that I have found with some of the companies is that they only have one, two, or three options. And that doesn't cover everybody. That's maybe covers, you know, a certain percentage of people, but not everyone. Absolutely. And I think what I've found with, you know, the cleanest ingredients and affordable prices, which is, you know, I serve families, so I'm always looking for affordability. I don't, I don't even really test out like $50 two ounce tubes, which is probably where you'll get more variety in the tints. I, there's only one brand that I know of that has different, um, different shades. Most of them are just one. Um, but I, so, I mean, they, they generally are just right down the middle. And if you just apply them a little bit more thinly or maybe mix them with another you know, something lighter. They look pretty, my husband's very fair skinned and they always look pretty good on him. Um, I mean, there have been some that make him look ridiculous and then we note it and demote it if they're not working for everyone, but most of the time they work pretty well. Or, and there are some that just go on so clear that you could easily put it on your face and then apply, you know, as a woman, makeup, foundation, powder or whatever, and it's not gonna interfere. And you could actually mix, can you mix in, and I, I, this is a little bit tricky because if it doesn't have an SPF, then you may not want to mix it into a sunscreen, uh, sunblock, but if it has an SPF to it, a powder uh, with a tint that already you're using on your skin, you could, ma you could blend that in, right? Possibly. I've never really played with that. I just put the powder on over top. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have tried that and it, it's, it, it works it depending, but again, if you're using something that doesn't have an SPF, then I'm concerned that it's going to decrease the efficacy of the actual sure. block. So be careful with blending. Uh, I, that's one thing I want to make sure that I remind people. Um, if you start blending in ingredients, um, different products, you're changing the SPF protection. Right. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about powders and sprays. <laughs> what did you learn about those? Well, first of all, there aren't 
very many um, zinc oxide based sprays or mineral based of any kind sprays. Um, most of the time, if you get a spray that's zinc or titanium, it's going to be more of like a squirt bottle, like you would use for a cleaning solution. So you have to, you squirt it on and then you still have to rub it in. Um, there are some that look exactly like the conventional brand. They, they look like an aerosol, but it's very different in the application. So I do mean, I just want to I kind of just want to warn people, like, don't buy a mineral-based spray and expect that you're going to do the thing where you just have your child stand with his back to you and go, and then he can run off. You well, always, 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 always have to people to do that anyway for multiple reasons. So Right. Uh, yeah. So, but, but people do. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, and it is easy. I have to admit when you've got kids and you've got multiple kids and you're at the beach and there's sand on them and all of that, it's tempting to want to use the sprays, but let's just be mindful of the fact that if you start off put the sunblock on before they go out into the beach, mm -hmm. that the, the zinc oxide ones are gonna last longer anyway. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you just have to, you do, will have to reapply at some point, but at least yeah. you have them covered before they even get wet or in the sand or anything. Right. Exactly. The, yeah, the zinc face do last longer. And the caveat is unless if you're toweling off, if you're wiping your face, you know, for kids for sure, when they're swimming, they're constantly wiping their face. So you'll still have to reapply as often with a zinc based if, if there's kind of wiping going on. But otherwise, I mean, it will last all day. And honestly, we've done random testing on the next day and you can still see the zinc working like in an AB test on a leg. So it does, it does really last much longer. Um, the, the big fear or the big danger with, with aerosolizing zinc is that as safe as zinc oxide is to sit on your skin, not safe at all for your lungs. So if there's any chance that you're breathing it in, and this is like another reason why I don't really like to recommend DIY sunscreen, because then you're working with the powder. And if you don't know proper safety protocol, you could be putting your own lungs in danger. Um, the other reason I don't recommend DIY is kind of what you talked about with the blending. Like <laughs> you're not going to get it FDA tested for SPF. And so if you have some inconsistency in the blending, you might have some SPF like four over on this side of your container and 50 on this side. And like, who knows? So I'm not a big, I'm a big fan of DIY for many, many things. Sunscreen just isn't one of them because you don't, you don't really know what you're doing. Um, so yeah, so I don't, I don't like any of the mineral based sprays um, for speed and efficiency. You know, you talked about for kids, it is so tempting. A stick for faces is a godsend. It's so quick and you can kind of put it on through the sand if you have to and just quickly rub it in. Um, and then, you know, we wear sun shirts. And that cuts down 75% of the work and the expense of sunscreen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I'm getting ready to do a whitewater rafting trip with my kids. And um, I'm, you know, I bought us all like the sun shirts and stuff because there's just no way we're going to be able to keep, keep up with the sunblock saying in a, you know, six days on a, on the river. <laughs> yeah. Your shoulders will thank you. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Lots of hats and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. And, and hats are a great thing too, of course. Yeah. And, you know, I always remind people that if you can plan your outdoor time in the morning and the eat later in the day mm -hmm. and just go inside, have the, your, you know, get catch up on work and, you know, maybe schoolwork and, you know, screen time, if you want that for your kids, that would be the time to do it, it would be the middle of the day, get them out of the sun. Um, so that you're at least avoiding those peak times, right? Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and then of course, over the last 10 years, all the research on vitamin D has changed too, because when my kids were tiny, that was what you said was exactly the recommendations. And now people are saying, well, but also you should probably get 10 minutes of unprotected sunshine right at noon for the most vitamin D synthesis in your skin. It's like, okay, so it gets to be a lot of balancing, but I do, I do try to get a little bit of unprotected sunshine midday for the kids if I can for vitamin D, especially here in Michigan. We do not see the sun enough. So we're very vitamin D deficient as a state. Yeah, we get well, a lot, plenty of sun in uh, Park City, Utah. So that doesn't, I mean, you know, of course it's cold in the winter, we're more covered up, but nope. <laughs> we're closer to the sun. Um, and uh, so, okay, well, that, and that's a good tip. And, you know, vitamin D, of course, is important. I do remind, I want to remind people that they can get their vitamin D levels tested to see yeah. if there's even really a concern. 25 hydroxy vitamin D is a lab test. You can get it done with your um, basic blood work and just ask your doctor to add it on. Um, kids can have it tested too. So then you know yeah. if you're in the optimal range for that. And if you need to supplement, get some more time in the sun, whatever you need to do to get that low, those levels up. It's a simple thing to do. 
Uh, and it is really important with immune system function and, and we do need those vitamin D levels. Okay. Yes. Great. Anything you want to say about powders? There's not a lot with powders. It's more around the makeups. And, but I wanted, I just wanted to, same thing with the sprays. If you're breathing it in, there yep. are concerns about it getting in uh, those nano sized particles, getting trapped in the lung tissue and creating issues. Right. And then of course the chemicals on screens are going to have similar issues. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it, powders, powders are just tricky, but you're right. A lot of natural, um, powders for women as makeup include zinc oxide just as sort of it's, it's not even meant to be in there as an spf factor it's just in there as like a light colored balance on the tint um so i you know it's it's worth saying maybe hold your breath while you <laughs> while you apply it because you really don't want to be breathing that in Okay. Okay, great. Let's, t let's go ahead and talk about some of your favorite brands. I'm really curious okay. um, to hear about that. Now, I, uh, I didn't test as many as you, but I did order a lot of different zinc oxide based on blocks a few years ago and I've, you know, throughout time to see if what we could carry on the Spa Doctor website. So if people go to the Spa Doctor website, you'll see that we carry a sunblock um, on, on the website. That we actually have two, two products and they meet, they meet my criteria um, because they're zinc oxide based and actually use them. I had my kids use them. I had my friends use them. I said, okay, what do you think? Which out of all these different ones, what do you like? And this, this particular brand, my shell was the one that, that we liked the most. So I'm curious what your take is on that brand. Great. Yeah, we did try that one. They are one that has the aerosol spray that looks like the conventional one. But again, all of those still go on white, still need to be rubbed, have some dangers with them. So it's just not worth it. The, there's no ROI in my opinion. Um, but yeah, we tried, I'm sure the my shell stick and that goes on very well. Um, I don't know if I ever tried it in the tube, but that was definitely a brand that was up there. Um, some of my favorites include one called Kokua, which is formulated in Hawaii and made with like seven different Hawaiian grown antioxidants which is worth mentioning, by the way, because, you know, anytime you're in the sun, even with a great sunscreen, you're always going to have some oxidative stress and some sun damage. And so putting antioxidants right on your skin with your sunscreen is a great idea. That's, that's an ingredient that I always look for. Um, so we love Kokua. It goes on incredibly smooth, just like a lotion, smells really good. Um, Raw Elements has been a favorite for years and they have tinted, they have sticks, they have tins, they have pumps, they have plastic free. And um, they're just very, 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 eco-friendly and reef safe. They were founded by a lifeguard. Um, and so like if you fly Hawaiian air, you'll get a sample of raw elements. So love them. And May Love is a little bit new to the scene. They were made by um, a bunch of college friends coming together from all different disciplines, like engineers and doctors and stuff. And so, and they're more of a skincare company. So I call them a good transition sunscreen because it goes on, it goes on really, really well, just like you would expect your conventional chemical sunscreen to. There's none of that tint at all. Um, a few, a few more ingredients that I'm not like, you know, I wouldn't eat it. Some of the other sunscreens you could literally eat if you were stranded on a desert, desert island. They're so clean. Um, but May Love just has, it's so up there because people love, they'll put it on and they'll be like, that was an amazing experience. <laughs> you know, this is that I have nothing bad to say about it. And others that I really like include Badger and that's great because you can buy it just about anywhere, big box stores. Think Baby is really good. Um, Third Rock, is a super unique formula. Have you ever tried Third Rock? Okay, um, it, it's made by like a super science geek chemist um, surfer. And I mean, I've talked to him for like hours and I don't, I don't even know, like, I don't even understand most of what he says. He's very, very intelligent, um, but it's a, it's a very interesting texture. You have to kind of rub it in your hands and then it goes on smooth. Um, it was one that went on the easiest when we were all sandy and wet and messy, I think because of its unique texture. And then Cabana is another one that I've enjoyed for years. It's formulated by a Stanford trained chemist. Um, and they, that's the one that has like nude and peach and tint and all, you know, all these different tints. Okay. And they have, they have tints for darker skin as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Well, good to know. I actually haven't tried any of these brands, so I'll have to, to try. Well, I tried Badger and I thought it was kind of sticky. Um, that wasn't, one of my favorites, but like you said, it's available everywhere. So it's a nice go-to. Mm -hmm. I and know they, Badger has a ton of different formulas. Oh, so okay. They've got so their sport formula, they've got their lotions, they've got their sticks and they've changed a lot over the years. I've had to retest them because they reformulated. So it kind of depends um, when you tested that. 
Yeah. Okay. Good to know. I know a lot of people like, um, and I don't really want to harp, you know, to say bad things about any any particular companies, but I know a lot of people use Sunbum. Is that one that they, I know they have a zinc oxide one? I haven't looked at it closely, but what do you think? It does have fragrance. Yep. I know that. I know. So I just dug into Sunbum again because we we actually went to Hawaii just before the bottom fell out of the world with the coronavirus snuck that in. Um, so that's a real story about the sun, the snorkel captain, like going, oh, nope, can't use this one. So the snorkel company had Sunbum. And I was like, oh, there's Sunbum. I didn't think I liked that one. So I dug into it a little more. One of the reasons I don't like to recommend Sunbum is because they had a lot of chemical sunscreens and one mineral sunscreen. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's too confusing for people because they'll see the brand, they'll remember the brand, and then they'll just grab it off the shelf. Yeah. Right. Without checking. So I prefer, I prefer to promote brands that like only do the right thing, I guess. Um, but yes, you're right. Sunbum also had fragrance. And I think there was one of their preservatives, which is kind of on my X list as far as like how it's rated at EWG. So Sunbum, not my favorite. I've never actually tried it, but because of all those reasons, I don't really want to. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay, well, you know, and there's so many and there, there are some good resources out there for people. So what do you recommend for people um, to go and find out more. And then I have one more question for you. I just, I just thought of, I know my customer, my, my people are going to ask you. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, I think people should go to kitchenstewardship.com slash sunscreen and just see the most up-to-date list, you know, from a mom who's actually tried things. But I also include there at that same link, just a, a download sunscreen shopping guide. So it's like, okay, if you're looking at a brand that I haven't tried, here's your criteria to evaluate it. And luckily it's really simple. Really, if you just look for zinc oxide, like you're better than 95% of the sunscreens on the market. That's easy. And then the other ingredients, it's what your audience probably already knows. You know, don't look, don't get parabens, don't get fragrance that you don't know what it is, um, stuff like that. It's, it's like the same criteria you would use to evaluate any personal product. Okay. So my last question is, when do you apply sunscreen? So um, that's something my customers ask me often is like, if I'm, when I'm using this product or skincare line and I'm using all these different steps mm -hmm. and you know, there are great antioxidants in our product. So it does provide that protection. So it's important to, to put those on before going in the sun, but you want to make sure you're putting the sunblock on at the right time. So what do you suggest for people? Well, okay. So I'm a kind of a low maintenance girl. I probably don't have quite as many layers of stuff on my face. So I defer to you for the order. I do want to, I want to correct you real quick. And you keep using the word sunblock. And that's one of those things that I think it was 2014 or 2011 that the FDA said, um, you can't put on a tube anymore. You can't actually say sunblock. Oh, okay. Because that makes it sound like it can actually block all of the rays. And that's not possible. You can't say waterproof. You can only say water resistant. So it's just a nomenclature thing, but because it used to be mineral sunscreens would call themselves sunblock uh -huh. to differentiate, but they can't do that anymore. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks for telling me that. Um, okay. Well, so what I usually tell people is to put the sunscreen on last and then get, mm -hmm. let all the other, you know, wash, you know, do you use the cleanser, use the antioxidant serums and the really great moisturizers, let those absorb into your skin, wait until they have actually absorbed so yeah. that you're getting the full effect of the, the sunscreen. Yeah. Yep. That makes perfect sense. And the, I mean, the great thing about the mineral sunscreens is that you can use it as a daily SPF and not be worrying like, oh, have I had two hours of, of sun exposure in these like little 10 minute chunks because it's just a normal day. I'm not at the beach, you know, do I need to reapply and redo my makeup? Like that's ridiculous. So if you want to have something that's a daily SPF, to me, zinc and titanium are the only options that make sense. Yeah. Well, Katie, thank you so much for all your information. I know we want, we, I, kept you on longer than I told you why, because there was so much to talk about. And I'm sure people have other questions. Tell everybody again what your website is, where they can find out more about you. Sure, they can find sunscreen info at kitchenstewardship.com slash sunscreen. Okay, perfect. Thanks again, Katie. Oh, you're welcome. Totally fills me up to geek out and share all this information. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Katie and learned some tips on how to choose the right sunscreen for your skin, your health, your family. And you can learn more about her by going to thespadoctor.com. Go to the podcast page with her interview. You'll find the information there. And I also encourage you to check out Clean Skin From Within, my book, to learn more about ingredients in skincare products. And I talk in the book and the clean 
slate section about the top ingredients to avoid in skincare products, including some sunscreen ingredients and what healthier alternatives to use in your skincare products because whether it's sunscreen or it's just your daily skincare routine, your body products, anything, you wanna make sure you're reducing your toxic, the toxic ingredients and then also using natural ingredients that really do help nourish your skin. And if you're looking for more information from the inside out on how to address issues with your skin, and don't forget to take the skin quiz. If you haven't done that already, just go to theskinquiz.com. Find out if you're an Amber, Olivia, Sage, Emmett, Heath, skin type, and you can just go to theskinquiz.com. And I also invite you to join us on social media. The Spa Doctor is on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You can join the conversation there, and I'll see you next time on the Spa Doctor podcast.